Greetings, culture bugs. And here we are for our second part of this reading. Take us from page 139 through about 149. And um, so as Elizabeth Dalloway has calmly and competently mounted the Westminster omnibus, we dive right into a scene with Septimus Smith. And look how um, Wolf accomplishes this. Going and coming, beckoning, signaling so the light and shadow which now made the wall gray now the bananas bright yellow now made the strand gray now made the omnibuses bright yellow seemed to septimus warren smith lying on the sofa in the sitting room okay so the um so obviously you've got that uh, that anaphora um four times makes an appearance here and so the the effect of it is to uh, to show us how how septimus is both fixed by the present and tortured by the past, um, I talked to you about the um, the Gilman story, the yellow wallpaper. So there, there, this uh, this color imagery uh, around Septimus is is predominantly yellow. And even though what um, what Wolf is doing is is connecting it to things like um, like bananas and like the the omnibuses and so forth, um, you can't escape that that sense of um, uh, of disquiet, disease. That's uh, that's related to uh, to that particular color. All right, um, here at the end, wanted to point something out to you and say, um, okay, so we have the simple diacopy in the uh, the sound of the dogs uh, barking and barking far away. Fear no more, says the heart and the body. Fear no more. Um, so this this takes us back to the uh, to the reference to uh, Cymbeline, the uh, Shakespeare problem play. Fear no more the heat of the sun, and um, so I would ask you a question: If this here is um, simple diacopy, barking and barking, what would be needed to make this into epizuxis? Uh, what would be needed if we were uh, going to take the phrase "fear no more," says the heart and the body, "fear no more"? How would we make that into a pimony? So I'm probably going to ask you a question about that on the quiz. Okay, so here, here as we get to the um, um, the scene between Septimus and and Retzia Smith. Um, so from the bottom of the this page, where he says he was not afraid, at every moment nature signified by some laughing hint, like that gold spot which went round the wall, there, there, there. Her determination to show by brandishing her plumes, shaking her tresses, flinging her mantle this way and that, beautifully, always beautifully, and standing close up to breathe through her hollowed hands, Shakespeare's words, her meaning. I mean, this without question is a good example of foreshadowing, okay? And um, because we talked, when we, when we unpacked that... Um, uh, that allusion to the Cymbeline play, it is uh, the sense that uh, over the course of that long lyric in the play, it's the idea that that once one is dead, all the um, all the negative elements that are related to having a physical body uh, go away, all your troubles go away, this sort of thing. So it's it's an echo in a way, um, also of Hamlet and his. Um, his musings about what it would be like to be to be dead, you know, to um, uh, when you've shuffled off the mortal coil and and um, you know these sorts of things. So this is in the mind of uh, of Septimus, and it, like I said, it's a good example of foreshadowing because he is now equating this sense of being uh, being dead to beauty. And nature here, of course, is being um, metaphorically compared to a female. All right, her determination to show by brandishing her plume. So brandishing is typically a, a verb that you're going to use associated with weapons. Um, so again, uh, Wolf packs a lot into um, um, into her word choice here. So this is a classic epizuxis, uh, three times the repetition of the single word. And it's also an example of elaborative diacopy. Beautifully, always beautifully. Okay, so again, I'm probably going to ask you to to talk about 
what are some of the elements there? And like I said, and I've, I've said this to people before, you don't have to watch these vids to, um, uh, to get this stuff. If you've paid attention over the course of the year um, and have remembered these things, then um, you should be perfectly able to, to assess um, some of the artistic elements that are occurring. Uh, pushing down into this, this part of the page, uh, so again, this is Rezia, who's sitting at the table, and she's she's trying to make a hat. And um, uh, so we have this uh, this kind of horror uh, that, that's going through the mind of Septimus about Dr. Holmes and Sir William Bradshaw, who are, he, he believes, are, are conspiring against him, that they represent the world that is pressing down on him. Some things were very beautiful, others sheer nonsense. So this is... She's talking about um, he reflecting on things that that Septimus asks her to write down, perhaps demands that she write down for him. And he was always stopping in the middle, changing his mind, wanting to add something, hearing something new, listening with his hands up. So this is an example of diazugma, where um, your uh, the subject disappears just as Septimus is in the act of disappearing. But she heard nothing. So the antithesis here highlights the gap between them as, uh, as husband and wife, as two human beings. So as we get out here to the, um, um, to the top of page 141. Then there were the visions he was drowned, he used to say, and lying on a cliff with the gulls screaming over him. He would look over the edge of the sofa down into the sea, or he was hearing music. Really, it was only a barrel organ or something, and so it's uh, so he starts to cry to see a man like Septimus who had fought, who was brave, crying. So this is is uh, really distresses uh, Retzia, but also underscores her view of masculinity, uh, like that of the English. It does not allow for emotional display. Okay, let's see. Um, so here on page 142, it, it, this is kind of a tender scene because although it begins, uh, the scene begins there with the um, kind of a recapping, um, uh, a reiteration of the, the difficulties that have arisen between the two of them, especially in the mind of Retzia regarding Septimus's behavior. Over the course of this scene, they are going to uh, to draw closer and closer together um, she's going to see him like his old self, and he is going to uh, to be happy uh, just at the moment when, you know, sort of ironically, everything's going to come to an end. So here we go. He began very cautiously to open his eyes to see whether a gramophone was really there, but real things, real things were too exciting. Uh, this is a pimony, of course. Let's see. Um... And then here at the end, uh, at the end of that that paragraph, uh, none of these things moved. All were still. All were real. So you've got the isocolon, uh, the repetition of that, um, or that, or I should say, that parallel structure of those two uh, clauses. And so when Retzia says that uh, she, being Miss um, Filmer, is a woman with a spiteful tongue, then you should recognize that as synecdoche. And then as we uh, push down here to the bottom. I'm going to introduce you to uh, to another. Uh, we've talked about the rhetorical question as a as a rather general uh, device that is used in in argumentation, but also in um, you know in service of fiction, as we're seeing here with this uh, with this novel. And um, erotema, e r o t e m a, is the umbrella term for. Uh, for the use of questions for rhetorical ends. And what we've got here is um, a new type of rhetorical question that I'm going to touch on uh, just in a second. So, but there was nothing terrible about it. Okay, this is the sewing. He assured himself, looking a second time, a third time at her face, her hands, for what was frightening or disgusting in her as she sat there in broad daylight sewing. Again, there's the question. Mrs. Peters had a spiteful tongue, repetition then of that, um, that synecdoche. Mr. Peters was in Hull. Why then rage and prophesy? The question. Why fly scourged and outcast? The question. Why be made to tremble and sob by the clouds? 
the question, why seek truths and deliver messages when Retzia sat sticking pins into the front of her dress and Mr. Peters was in hall? Uh, so this is a, a figure called um, Aporia, A-P-O-R-I-A, and it's reasoning with oneself by asking questions. Reasoning with oneself by asking questions. Um, it, it can have the... Uh, the effect is to to calm oneself, to soothe oneself. Um, and then here, the epizuxis uh, of the down-down. So I'm going to ask you a question about this, uh, about aporia. And I'm going to ask you to differentiate between that and, uh, say, anthropophora. So anthropophora, then, is the asking of a question and then the provision of an answer. And uh, aporia... Is, is not like that. It's it's the use of the question, but um, the the answer is not self-evident. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, so, uh, Retsy is making this hat uh, for Mrs. Peters, and um, it, it's a it's a moment of humor between the two of them. Uh, it's too fall, small for Mrs. Peters, said Septimus. For the first time for days, he was speaking as he used to do. Of course, it was absurdly small, she said, but Mrs. Peters had chosen it. He took it out of her hands. He said it was an organ grinder's monkey's hat. Um, how it rejoiced her that. Uh, so it's really interesting that she's using a um, that, that's sort of an English expression. Um, not for weeks had they laughed like this together, poking fun privately like married people. And then... Um, there, she said, pinning a rose to one side of the hat. Never had she felt so happy, never in her life. So the anaphora combined with the hyperbole is for emotion. It's to, um, to just give us a sense of, of just how, in a way, how relieved she is that he is, um, is acting as he used to. So she's been worried all this time about, um, about his, you know, so-called madness, and even the glimmer of this man that she married as being like he used to be is enough for her to then just swell all the way, you know, like a um, like a seesaw, uh, to swing all the way back to uh, to a sense of of being happy. It's the same thing of a maybe a a person in an abusive relationship. Um, when they are downtrodden and beaten and abused, and one moment of kindness seems to fill in for all the uh, all the countless moments of of terror and so forth that one would experience. Um, so it is in the human mind, um, always looking for something uh, something positive to hang on to. Let's see. So push over here to page one forty four. And uh, so Retzia has has. Um, uh, has improved the hat. There it is, said Retzia, twirling Mrs. Peter's hat on the tips of her fingers. That'll do for the moment. Later, her sentence bubbled away, drip, 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 like a contented tap left running. So you have the epizuxis, uh, classical epizuxis of the three times repetition of the word drip. We have the personification, of course, uh, with the, the water, or the, the tap, rather, is the contented thing and that's generally I mean it could be animation I suppose but um, but it's not a, uh, a sound that is troubling in fact it's it's soothing and then you've got the simile okay um, so I may ask you about that okay so let's see it was wonderful never had he done anything which made him feel so proud again hyperbole it was so real it was so substantial mrs. Peters hat just look at it he said Yes, it would always make her happy to see that hat. He had become himself then. He had laughed then. They'd been alone together always. She would like that hat. Um, so here's a, a new device uh, worth pointing out. It's called Simplochi. And what it is is a, a combination of anaphora, which you know is the repetition of a word or words at the beginning, uh, beginnings of phrases, clauses, sentences, epistrophe, is the repetition of these uh, of words, a couple of words at the ends of phrases, clauses, or sentences, and in combination 
it's called Simplici. So the combination then characterizes the normal Septimus, a cheerful, happy personality. Okay, He had become himself then, he had laughed then, so that you can see the, the, the movement from himself to laughed, and so it's the indirect characterization of Septimus as uh, normally, you know, an upbeat guy. Okay. Uh, here, then, at the bottom of the page, we have a nice example of uh, extended diacopy. What always happened then happened. What happened every night of their lives, and it's the little girl that comes. Uh, and, and of course, there's it should be in your mind the echo of um, kind of a longing related to to what Rezio really wants, which is children. Uh, she, and she wants to have a a child with her husband, of course. And so, when this little girl, um, the uh, the granddaughter of, uh, I guess, the woman who is their uh, their landlady uh, comes by. Uh, you know, Rezia went down on her knees. Rezia cooed and kissed. Rezia got a bag of sweets. So you, you can see all that, uh, the repetition of her name then as he is focusing. So we're seeing this through his mind, through his, um, uh, his eyes. And so he's so focused on her. And again, it's this, this marvelous little domestic scene that, that it seems like things are, are maybe going to turn out okay. Okay, so we've got the, um, the simple diacopy at the end, dancing, skipping round and round the room they went. Um, and then we've got, um, he was very tired, he was very happy, he would sleep, he shut his eyes. So this is all... Uh, more isocolon. So when you're talking about the um, uh, that parallel structure and and that that sort of patterning is is just pleasing in terms of its um, of its regularity, its order, uh, especially in a scene that normally would we would think of as chaotic, given the um, sort of agitated state of uh, of Septimus's mind, at least as we've known him over the course of this this particular narrative. Okay, so let's see. Um, we'll push over to page 146. And she is, um, you know, continuing uh, her sewing. Ah, oh, damn, she cried. It was a joke of theirs, her swearing. The needle had broken. Hat, child, Brighton, needle. So this is an example then of uh, ellipsis. You know, ellipsis to be... A, an incomplete sentence, grammatically incomplete. Either the um, the subject has been left out, the verb has been left out, or in the case um, of this elliptical sentence, both subject and uh, verb have been have been left out. He's just naming things here as he sees them around the room. So I guess you could say maybe that's the subject. There is the hat. There is the child uh, in his mind. Okay. So, just to say, uh, and this is also an example of a syndeton because you got those items in a series that are that are separated by um, by only the the commas. So, what's the effect of it? It is that what she is trying to convey is the sense of of Septimus just focusing his attention on these things, sort of almost simultaneously. Uh, this, 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 this. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, We can see as we as we push down into this paragraph, and again, uh, uh, Wolf is setting us up for something. They were perfectly happy now, she said, suddenly putting the hat down, for she could say anything to him now because he seems as though he is uh, like his old self, and she doesn't have to worry about agitating him in any kind of way. She could say whatever came into her head. That was the first thing she had felt about him that night in the cafe when he had come in with his English friends. So she's going to go into this slight flashback about when they first met. And again, it's a poignant scene um, that, you know, the, the things that um, that a person finds uh, attractive and interesting in another person, they end up staying with you. And, and this is, of course, what it is that she is, um, uh, is cataloging here, what made him different from other, uh, other English soldiers um, and... Um, Particularly uh, different because he's smaller than uh, than his uh, the kind of men that her sister admires. Okay. Uh, 
describes him as a as a young hawk. That first evening she saw him when they were playing dominoes. And you get the sense that um, uh, that maybe at the beginning, we don't know if, if Rezia's English is all that great, uh, but a game like dominoes is one that you can play with someone and you don't have to, you know, checkers, chess, these sorts of things. You don't have to speak the same language as the other person. The game is the uh, is the language. It's the way that you can interact. So here we go. Um, she had never seen him wild or drunk, only suffering sometimes through this terrible war. But even so, when she came in, he would put it all away. Anything, anything in the whole world, any little bother with her work, anything that struck her to say, she would tell him, and he understood at once. So this again, this is the, the whatever it is that drew her to him. So you've got the, um, the epizuxis, and the effect is vehemence. She, it, it, you get the, the, the thought that, uh, that she's never been able to really do this with anyone else, uh, never you know, sort of felt comfortable enough, um, trusting enough, uh, allowed herself to be vulnerable with him, that she could tell him anything. And here we go with the, um, the, the scene's going to change when the, there's the anticipation that Sir William Bradshaw is going to make an appearance. And so, just like we had in the earlier uh, part of the narrative with, with respect to the repetition of Miss Kilman um, in the mind of Clarissa Dalloway and how she is obsessed, uh, we now see this with Septimus. But you remember Bradshaw said, the people we are most fond of are not good for us when we're ill. Bradshaw said, he must be taught to rest. Bradshaw said, they must be separated. Must, must, why must? What power had Bradshaw over him? What right had Bradshaw to say must to me, he demanded. Okay. And so all that repetition again is 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 how we're, how the scene is shifting around to, um, to Septimus being terrified by the memory of what it is that he he believes that um, guys like Bradshaw and Holmes mean to him. Okay, um, so as we have this return to him wanting to get him wanting to see the the writings that he had had Rizia do for him, and and you can see now it's this it's this downward uh, slide. Uh, in, in terms of his mental state. And I think it just speaks to how, um, how precarious was his mental state to begin with, that it's just the, this, you know, anything sets him off. And so here he is. Um, Burn them, he cried. For now his writings, now for his writings, how the dead sing behind rhododendron bushes, odes to time, conversations with Shakespeare. Evans, Evans, Evans. So the epizuxis for vehemence. Um, we haven't seen uh, ekphenesis. Well, I just haven't pointed it out in a while. But here's a, a good example of ekphenesis, which is the um, the emotional outburst. Now we saw this a lot in um, in the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins. Okay, so make a note of that to yourself. Ekphenesis, the emotional outburst, uh, the ex the exclamatory. Uh, statement. And so we have the repetition of that again to uh, to reveal his heightened emotional state. Tell the Prime Minister universal love, the meaning of the world, burn them, he cried. Baretzia laid her hands on them. Some were very beautiful, she thought. She would tie them up, for she had no envelope with a piece of silk. Even if they took him, she said, she would go with him. They could not separate them against their wills, she said. So the epistrophe is, is to emphasize her, her determination here then. Okay? And then you can see how it, it, it plays out here at the uh, later on down the page. There, she said, again, ekphenesis, the papers were tied up. No one should get at them. She would put them away. And she said, nothing, would sep nothing should separate them. She sat down beside him and called him by the name of that hawk or crow, which being malicious and a great destroyer of crops was precisely like him. No one could separate them, she said. So there's a great irony here, of course, because then she got up to go into the bedroom to pack their things, but hearing voices downstairs and thinking that Dr. Holmes had perhaps called, ran down to prevent him coming up. 
Septimus could hear her talking to Holmes on the staircase. My dear lady, I've come as a friend, Holmes was saying. No, I will not allow you to see my husband, she said. He could see her like a little hen with her wings spread, barring his passage. So this is Retzia then, if you're going to, we're going to unpack that. And I'm going to ask you about that on the, on the quiz probably. So uh, the tenor then is Retzia. Uh, the vehicle is a little hen. And the ground then is a, pro a protective maternal figure. You'll remember this from that, um, uh, the Gerard Manley Hopkins poem with the, with the Holy Ghost um, is, is protecting the world as its brood. Uh, and this is the same idea. And so here's the, uh, the spiraling of, uh, of the situation out of control. But Holmes persevered. My dear lady allowed me. Holmes said, putting her aside, Holmes was a powerfully built man. Holmes was coming upstairs. Holmes would burst open the door. Holmes would say, in a funk, eh? Holmes would get him. But no, not Holmes, not Bradshaw. Getting up rather unsteadily, hopping indeed from foot to foot, he considered Mrs. Filmer's nice clean bread knife with bread carved on the handle. Ah, but one must not spoil that. The gas fire? But it's too late now. Holmes was coming. Razors he might have got, but Retsu, who always did that sort of thing, had packed them. There remained only the window. The large Bloomsbury lodging house window, the tiresome, the troublesome, and rather melodramatic business of opening the window and throwing oneself out. See how suddenly that appears? And again, this is the one of the benefits of this particular narrative style is that she can just spring things on you in a way that is as jarring as they would be to the people that are, are in attendance of the scene or at the scene. It was their idea of tragedy, not his or Retzia's, for she was with him. Holmes and Bradshaw like that sort of thing. He sat on the sill, but he would wait till the very last moment. He did not want to die. Life was good. The sun hot. Okay, so notice this... Um, Elliptical sentence, but it's also under the category of diazugma. Only human beings. What did they want? Coming down the staircase, opposite an old man stopped and stared at him. Holmes was at the door. I'll give it you, he cried and flung himself vigorously, violently, down onto Mrs. Filmer's area railings. Good place to stop, right? Okay. See you soon.